First, let me uh, say what a pleasure it is to be here. Um, Jim was a little bit worried that I wasn't going to come here last week. <laughs> and it was quite funny, so my executive assistant, uh, Susan, was in my office and she said, you need to make that call. I said, what call? She said, you need to call Jim and get him on the phone right now. I said, I'm sitting right here, so you better call him and tell him you can't come to BC. So I called Jim and I said, Jim, how are you? Good. Um, I guess I'll see you in Toronto on Wednesday. He said, no, I don't think so. Ooh, I said, hmm, so, um, and you think that it's really important for me to come out to BC? Yes. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, I guess there's not a possibility of me kind of declining, right? No. <laughs> And then I says, well, um, I guess I'll call you later. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> now, Susan, in her infamous wisdom, said, you're a bloody chicken shit. Do you know that? <laughs> I said, Susan, hey, life is complicated. Um, what could I tell you? And she said, you are going to go to BC. She said, you know, you're really mad. I said, no, I'm not mad. The fact is, uh, sisters and brothers, it is an honor for me to be here uh, for many reasons. One, I can tell you, uh, your president and your organization make me feel just like I'm at home in my own union. It's as simple as that. I understand fundamentally what you do as teachers and education workers. I have a young daughter. She's only seven years age. She only spent one year in school, public school. And within one year, this kid speaks more fluent French than her mother and father could ever hope for. You know why that is? Because she has some of the best instructions in her class from teachers like you in Ontario who are members of the elementary teachers. And every time I look at my kid, I said, if it wasn't for the public education system, where would this country be? So I want to start off to thank you from the bottom of my heart for what you do on behalf of working families across this country. You know, I have a ton of respect for your organization and your leadership. You have, of course, a strong track record of fighting for public education in this province, for students, for workers' rights, and more importantly, for social justice. BCTF members makes a difference every day when you help students get the skills and the knowledge and the confidence they need to take on the world. And you know what? It's about time we have a provincial government in this province that respect and understood that. There's no doubt about it, you're dealing with one of the toughest, nastiest, meanest government in this province. There's no, there's no misunderstanding about that. But you know, you always have to fight for your rights. The minute you surrender, the other side win. And I know this union will never surrender. Never surrender. I also want you to know something, because as a president, I don't have to come here and involve myself in your affairs. But there's one fundamental difference with me as a president. Wherever you're going to be fighting, I want you to know one thing. You're president of the Labour Congress. Under my leadership, I will be there side by side, toe to toe behind you. Because no workers in this country should feel they should fight alone. Regardless of where that struggle is, I intend to be there to support them. Because fundamentally, employers and government need to understand one thing. We are not going to simply relinquish our fundamental rights to defend the gains we have made in collective bargaining in this country. Not now, not ever. You know, the challenges that the economy and the world is facing, we had nothing to do with it. Those people who have ruined the world economy in 2008 with their reckless responsibility of how they <laughs> manipulate. <laughs> yeah. You know those? There we go. With their reckless disregard for working people, in 2008, 
created the biggest financial crisis and economic crisis we've seen since the Great Depression. And ever since then, rather than them being held responsible for the crisis they create, this working people and the trade union movement told, it's your fault. You have to agree with austerity. You have to take less. You have to tighten your belt. And I say, by God, when those bastards tighten their belt, that's when I'm going to begin to tell our members to tighten their belt. We didn't create the mess. We're not going to pay for it. Yes, sisters and brothers, we have got to fight back and we've got to mobilize because the austerity agenda is killing the dreams of working people, not just here in our country, but throughout the world. I sent a message to my colleagues in Greece who have had to endure one of the greatest austerity challenges of any country because I want working people to know in that country they have a friend in Canada. We will stand beside them to defend the gains they have made in their country because how do you tell a senior who can no longer go to work they got to live with less public pension and they have to continue to do all these things yet the bankers they create the mess the wealthy who never paid their taxes are never held accountable. Shame. It's absolutely a disgrace. And I know one thing, if we don't fight it now, what's happening in Greece, it will equally come here one day, and then we will have nobody to defend their collective rights. The Greece people have every right to say, the hell with your austerity agenda. I want to thank your union for the support and the work you've been doing, of course, to help us on the fight against Bill 377. Stephen Harper says this bill is needed to make unions financially transparent. And we know that's total bullshit, to put it politely. <laughs> we almost, need, almost defeated this awful bill, but the Conservative rigged the game at the last minute. Our fight isn't over, sisters and brothers. The bill is unconstitutional. Make no mistake about that. It's discriminatory, and more importantly, it will invade the privacy of working people in this country. We will challenge in the courts. We're going to be strategic. We need to give ourselves, of course, the best shot for a victory. And the CLC is working with its affiliates to coordinate a strategy, a legal one, of course, that will be launched when the appropriate. But I say to my friends across this country, here's what the Prime Minister, in my view, this is one reason I think this bill, uh, the one reason this bill got through Parliament. It is Stevens Harper, of course, is very personal. They didn't have to pass 377. As a matter of fact, for over three years, it sat, sat in the Senate languishing because they couldn't get it through. Their own colleagues in the Senate said, there's something fundamentally wrong. But this Prime Minister is vindictive. Make no misunderstanding about it. He's a partisan. And more importantly, his determination, of course, to weaken the labor movement in this country will not stop until we get rid of him. But sisters and brothers, if you truly want to, of course, stop Bill 377, I'm going to ask all of you, because by the way, I didn't come up here today as a pretty face just to talk to you. <laughs> Have no misunderstanding about that. We're in the fight of our lives for the future of this country, and every single one of you is going to take some responsibility in that fight. It's as simple as that. If we want to stop this bill, guess what, my friends? We need to defeat Stephen Harper and his conservatives at the ballot box on October the 19th. They'll never build 377, will ever become law in this country. Never. Now, I may get a little bit partisan and excuse my bias because I'm a working class kid who understood very clearly. Where in your fighting, you need friends. I'm a New Democrat, and I'm proud of the fact I'm a New Democrat. I spend a lifetime dreaming one day in my lifetime, I will see a national government that represents the aspirations of working people will fight on behalf of working people. Oh, Christy Clark, would you quit pissing around with the lights? <laughs> but sisters and brothers, it's 53 days, of course, before the election. 53 days. We need all hands on deck. You can't make a difference sitting on the sidelines. 
This is too important. And for me, it's very personal. It is very personal. Democracy is not a spectator sport. Like it or not, you've got to take some ownership and responsibility. We need, of course, to raise the issues that are important to working people at the ballot box. Expose the damage the Harper has done. Show people there is better choices that it can make in terms of the government they elect. And get our members to help candidates like Brother Sudhu, who's here today, who's running in this riding for the NDP. Get our members to go out and help canvas for NDP candidates, to put up signs, to do whatever you can to volunteer, and more importantly, to get our members to vote. If you don't vote, you can't affect our democracy. You allow those other people to make the decision for you, then you have no right to complain. That's how we defeat Stephen Harper on October the 19th. Our Congress have made the decision to raise four issues that we thought was very important in this election. Good jobs, retirement security, child care and health care. The first is good jobs. Harper says this election is about economic leadership. I says, bring it on. <laughs> bring it on, Prime Minister, because I want to talk about your records. Because Harper's has one of the worst economic records of any prime minister since World War II. The worst. Go read Jim Stanford's analysis of our prime minister and his government for the last 10 years. Let's look at the facts. After 10 years of Stevens Harper's management of the economy, today, as I speak to you, 2 million Canadians are jobless. 2 million. Unemployed or underemployed in this country. Who wants to work but can't find work. If that's what good economic leadership, by God, the rest of us need to get drunk. <laughs> Most of the new jobs being created in this country are part-time, temporary, and precarious. I came from the city last night, city of Toronto. Their families are crisscrossing the city, mothers and fathers, doing three jobs to make ends meet. Three jobs. Could you imagine the stress? Families with children, but that's what they have to do because they can't find one decent full-time job that pays enough money to look after their families. One million Canadians have to work in more than two jobs in this country. That is a statistical evidence after 10 years of this Prime Minister's record. That's not leadership, my friends. That's incompetence of our Prime Minister and his government. Here's what the Bank of Canada says. The Bank of Canada says our economy is atrocious and on the edge of a recession. That's what our Bank of Canada governor has said. Corporations are making huge profit. Their tax went from 23% down to 15%. Yet we can't see the jobs, we can't see the investment in our countries. One million Canadians today, as I speak to you, are using food banks in this country. One million, every single day. They go to food banks. And every young people that get an opportunity to finish their education leave with $35,000 worth of debt. The first house I bought cost $48,000. Here is kids today leaving university with the biggest debt load in the history of our country. One of the richest G7 countries. And this will we tell young people, this is supposed to be the bright future we promised them? By God. I hope we have a government that wants to say, anybody who wants a secondary education in this country, it's free, we'll pay for it from the tax base of the citizens of this country. <laughs> How does our Prime Minister respond when you give him these statistics? He, sh he shrugged his shoulder. Here's what he says. He says, we have one of the best economic record of the G20 countries. What I don't know who he's looking at, <laughs> or who he's measuring, if that's one of the best record in this country, my God, shame on the rest of the world. Because that's, there's no truth to the reality of what this Prime Minister economic record has been. That's not leadership, my friend. 400,000 manufactured jobs disappeared under this Prime Minister. 400,000. Manufactured jobs create six spin-off jobs in every community where they existed. Yet the Prime Minister did absolutely nothing. He threw in the towel in the auto industry, one of the most important sectors of the economy, basically gave up. We're going to support the oil and gas industry, and now that it's crashing on the rocks, he has no other alternatives to offer Canadians. 
Since the Prime Minister of Corbyn in office, Mexico has gained seven new auto plants. Canada has lost two. And this has been his economic leadership. 20,000 Canadians were kicked out of their jobs when Future Shop and Target lost their jobs. 20,000 overnight. Not one of them qualify for one penny of unemployment insurance benefit. Guess the other side of it. In the most recent budget that they introduced, they took over $2 billion from the unemployment insurance fund. Income splitting. In the city of Toronto, 80%, as one example, 80% of the unemployed gets not a penny. If you're wondering the taxpayers who are paying for social assistance is so high, because when the government stiff working people who don't get any benefits, guess who pick, pick, pop, pick up the tab? In Toronto, it's the local taxpayers that pay for social assistance. Imagine all the kids, and mothers and fathers, who can't put food on the table because this man has rigged the rules they can never qualify for the benefit they pay for. It's like paying for life insurance, die and tell your family, oh, sorry, there is no check coming in the mail, despite the fact that working people pay for this. How is it that a prime minister and government can take $2 billion from a fund to offer income splitting to the richest families in this country and have no respect for the working people who put money into that fund? Sisters and brothers, it's not leadership. It's a decade of decline, and Cana Canadians know our economy is in trouble. They know Harper's plan isn't working, and they're looking for better choices. So here's what we said in the Canadian Labour Congress. We need long-term funding to repair our crumbling infrastructure across this country. Long-term funding. Every community in this country knows what I'm talking about. We need investment in public education and training. So those who want to go back to work, we can give them the skills they need so they can figure out what they need to do, of course, as the economy continues to change. We need a building high skills in a world in, with, high, with high wage economy. We need a government that will be championing the manufacturing sector and partner with labor and industry to secure investment and jobs for the future. Number four, we need new investment in renewable, renewable energy and clean technology. Climate change is real. On your behalf, I get to travel the world. I see the ravages of climate change in places that people yet to imagine what's happening with climate change. Our Prime Minister spent 10 years being a climate denier. 10 years since he's been in office. We have the worst record. We walk away from Kyoto. When we should be leading this said the future can be a bright future. But at the same time, we need to take care how we're going to create jobs, new jobs in industry. I went to Germany recently, 400,000 jobs in the green industry in that country because there's economic and political leadership from the chancellor. And they, they did it from ground zero. Yet the country that's going to be ravaged with climate change can't even come to terms we need to reduce our levels of pollution in the world. Number five, we need fair trade deals. It doesn't sell out our country and our democracy. Yes, we believe in trade. And we're prepared to trade with other countries. But the fact of the matter is, we can never let corporation rights supersede the rights of our democracy. When that happens, it's a perverse way. The next issue I want to talk to you, sister and brother, because you're the fortunate ones. Today, as I'm speaking to you today, 11 million Canadians going to work, 11 million people, 60% of the population who have no pension, none. The average CPP benefits in this country is a little bit over $500 per month. For women, it's even worse, under $500. RSP is not doing anything to help people save. We've got over $700 billion of unused RSP contribution because people cannot make the contribution despite a generous tax benefit at the end of the day. Public pension, of course, to a large extent, doesn't get you to the poverty line. What's been the Prime Minister's response to the challenges to expand the CPP? He's attacking their government has done more to harm private pensions since they've been in office. He's helping, of course, the richest family with voluntary savings. Double the tax-free savings account. Yes, it's great if you have the wealth in this country. For the most Canadians, that's not a reality. He's bashing province like Kathleen Wynne for saying she's going to create an Ontario pension plan because the federal government would not move to expand the CPP. And guess what he did? 
He went to Davos, a millionaire's club, and billionaire's club, to give a speech to tell them that he's going to tell us we have to work two years longer to get our OS and GIS. Not even the courage to have a debate in our own country about such a fundamental policy change where Sisson Brothers, more seniors today are living in poverty in our country despite the gains we have made in the past to reduce seniors' poverty. More seniors are paying rent in utilities they can't afford. They're making decisions. Do I pay the rent or do I buy food? What's the choice? More seniors today are using food banks because their primary source of income, public pension, does not get them enough. They go to the food bank to supplement what they can't afford to buy on their own. By the way, let's have no misunderstanding. I'm not telling about an imaginary group. Every one of you in this room knows somebody who I'm talking about. I have a 92-year-old mother. Had it not been for my personal contribution, she'd be living in object poverty right now. That's my 92-year-old mother. Because every month I ensure I make a contribution to make sure she have a decent life. She spent a lifetime working in this country. No fault of her own that she's poor. But she gave her contribution to help build this country. And by God, we should take care of those poor seniors in our country. So for the six years in the Congress, we've crisscrossed the country to build support to expand the CPP, and we're going to get the job done because the majority of province are now on side to support us to make this happen. All we need is another new government. We also need to roll back OS and GIS to 65. How do you tell someone who's spent a lifetime working when their bad body's been ravished, they got to work another two years more? If the Prime Minister really knew what hard work was about, he wouldn't make his dumb decision when he went to Davos. <laughs> and more importantly, we can afford to do this. We need to give seniors a raise. Those who are getting OIS and GIS in this country, they live in poverty, give them a raise. Raise their benefit, their above poverty, because every penny that we put in their pockets will be spent right back in the local economy. Third issue I want to talk to you about, sisters, is child care. Harper's record. In most cities, child care is over $1,000 per month, if you can find it. If you can find it. In some places, it's only one in five kids can find a regulated child, space, child care space in this country. What has been the Prime Minister's response? First, he destroyed the first national child care program that was supposed to start. One of his first acts as Prime Minister killed the program. Of course, then he introduced income splitting. 85% of working families will get nothing from income splitting. That's the facts. Only 15% of the richest families in this country get something. He increased the universal child care benefit. Talking about a flurry of baby bonus checks you saw there just in June or July. <laughs> we had that, what I call that buffoon called Pierre Polyev, that little piss-ass little man who doesn't know two things about hard work. <laughs> You know, if Pierre Polyev could get a shovel and dig a ditch, he might learn something about life. <laughs> Rather than lecturing working families in this country about hard work, he should go out and do some hard work. But by the way, we may get that chance on October the 19th because we can send him to the unemployment line and find out that there is no benefits. <laughs> Those checks is a corrupt vote buying scheme and it's not going to work. By the way, Despite the fact that they mail out their checks, their numbers been going down in the poll and not up in the poll. <laughs> what we need is a national affordable child care system for working families in this country. One that will give every kid a head start in early childhood learning so they can have a prosperous future. But more importantly, it would help working parents, especially women. And I want to be very, very clear about this. You know, for us men, we always talk about doing our fair share. It's absolute bullshit. We don't do our fair share. <laughs> Women do most of the work in rearing children in a home. It's a fact. Yes, I do my part, but I can say without any hesitation, my partner do twice as much as I do. The reality is, an affordable childcare is the one thing we can do 
to truly bring equality in this country for working women. And by God, <laughs> women have been fighting for this for decades. We're one election away for making this a reality in our country when our party's got the right plan. For every dollar we invest in childcare, we will get $2.50 back. We will pay those workers a decent wage. And more importantly, we will know for a fact that our kids are taken care in a safe environment so they can grow up after they finish that part of their life. When they come into your schools, they can have a head start. Why is it that only the wealthy can afford childcare in this country when working families are entitled to the same things? We need a national government that can commit to this and make sure it happens in our lifetime. Because it's one thing we can do, we can do that in this October 19th election. So let me touch very quickly on health care. Health care needs will change in this country like we've never seen. We're seeing an aging population will continue to happen. And needs, will, of course, will change. We'll have to evolve our health care system. What Tommy Douglas created was the best thing we ever did as a country. He showed courage and conviction against the odds to build something. But in the decades of neglect, we could lose it. Lose it within our lifetime. This is unacceptable, in my view. One of the biggest causes for bankruptcy in the United States, personal bankruptcy, is, is health care. Today, as I speak to you, there are many working families who can't afford a prescription because they don't have the money in the pocket. The decision they make, is it food on the table or is it medication? Why should people have to make those choices? Why can't we have a national pharmacare program? where if you need the medication, you should be able to get it without any costs so you can get well and keep the economy productive. Why can't we have home care as part of our national child care system? Every one of you in this audience know a grandmother or a mother who's going to need home care. Today, the needs for home care is over 800,000 people on a waiting list. By the way, that will not change. It will increase. And of course, since Harper's been in office over the 10 years, he has never, of course, enforced the Canada Health Act. The fact of the matter is, privatized health care is a fundamental affront to the national health care system in this country. We need a federal government that's going to stand up and hold the province accountable to say, you're going to enforce the act, otherwise we'll penalize you at the end of it. Four million Canadians right now don't have a family doctor. Four million. Yet we're a first world country. How could that possibly be at the same time? $45 billion worth of cuts is coming to health care starting in 2016, based on a decision the Harper government made about the future funding. $45 billion. Listen, sister and brother, let me make it clear. You take $45 billion out of the system, it will not remain the way it is. With all the stresses that currently exist, the reality is, the province will privatize even more. And their argument is going to be, we can't afford it. Yes, we can afford it. It, re it re requires political leadership and a commitment to the values of working people. Because you see, the rich, they're always going to have health care. They either get it here, they'll get on a plane and go get it wherever it exists. We don't have the luxury of getting on an airplane to go someplace else to get health care. We have to ensure the system we have here in this country are there for generations after generation. And if you truly care about it and you want to fight to ensure you protect it, kick out the Harper government on October the 19th when we get that chance. <laughs> Sisters and brothers, I spent the last year crisscrossing this country, not because I'm mad or I've got nothing better to do, <laughs> because I recognize fundamentally What's at stake? It's the future of our country, the future of our movement and our families. Leadership is not simply leading from the back of the parade or on the sidelines. You get in front. You engage, you challenge, you motivate, and you get people to be inspired that the fight is worth it. What's at stake in the future of our country on October 19th is the greatest challenge we ever see. This is one of the most important elections in our lifetime. 
because the choices we make will determine what kind of a Canada that we want to live in. Canada that is just, that is fair, that is equal, or a Canada that simply caters to the wealthy and the powerful, or a Canada that we know that we've been part of, one that we can continue to grow. See, as a young man, when I came to this country at 16, I had no idea, no idea how fortunate I was to be here. But I've learned in all my years of growing up and traveling this country, what a special place this country is. It's because people cared. You embr we embrace diversity. We embrace equality. We struggle against the odds to ensure how do our friends or neighbor have the same choices and opportunities as we do. This has always been our country. Tommy Douglas struggled against the odds to create health care when our American friend says there's only one way, it has to be privatized. He took on the doctors in Saskatchewan who went on strike and says, you do it, we're going to go on strike. He says, well, so be it. We're going to do it anyway. We've got public pensions. All of these things were built by generations of Canadians who understood if we care for each other, we can build a better country. If this man gets elected on October the 19th, it will forever change. As I talk to you right now, 17% of Canadians believe he's telling the truth in the Mike Duffy trial. 83% think he's lying. 83. By the way, there's even more people who believe Elvis is still alive in our country. <laughs> so I want to conclude, sisters and brothers. I want to conclude. Right here in your province of British Columbia, the NDP is running almost close to 38% nationally in this province. 38% of people in British Columbia support the NDP party. But it's going to require hard work to elect a new national government. We have got to win in every province across this country. So I'm going to ask you to do a few things. You've got to take some ownership to this election. You know, it's not hard work. I've been going out canvassing across the country. People say, what the hell are you doing that for, Sam? Because I want to show people that we can do little things to make big things happen. Yes, people come, they join me, we knock on doors on behalf of NDP candidates because I fundamentally believe this is about choices. I'm asking you to do whatever you can. We have our brother right here in the writing that you're meeting, by the way. All of you, some of you, can go up to his office this afternoon or sometime this evening and say, hey, we want to help. What can we do to help you? It'll make a difference. But more importantly, you need to talk to your friends and your neighbor about this election. You need to have that conversation at your own dinner table. Because we represent 3.3 million workers across this country. If we get one family member to join in our cause, to vote against this government, trust me, they cannot get reelected. If you think the thing they have done in the last four years since they've had a majority, have been awful, Think of what they would do should they get another majority in this country. I know one thing, sisters and brothers. I can't sit on the sidelines. I can't sit on my hands. And I can't pretend what this is about. That meeting that Jim talked about last night is the first time in our history as a Congress we held an emergency meeting to talk about the future of this country in this election. We left there unanimously committed that we are going to work to elect an NDP government in this country. So let me conclude to say to all of you, I value my friendship in your organization. I value the work that you do every single day because I see it in my daughter's face when she comes home. She may not live here in your province, well, one of your colleagues in Ontario, when she go to class, she comes home. She tells me her stories in French. The other day she was so cute, she was in Montreal, she left me a message in French. So when I got back, she said, Daddy, did you hear my message? I said, yes, sir, I heard your message. She said, did you understand it? So I said, well, a few words I did, but not much. She said, well, you know, Daddy, it's not too late for you to learn to speak French. <laughs> it's kids. But you know, seriously, what you do, you shape the minds and the dreams and the hopes of generations of young people to believe in this country, to believe in equality and social justice and fairness, because you instill a pride in them, how they should behave. 
I wish more adults will learn from their children and behave like kids. If they did, we'll be in a better world and a better country. But more importantly, your passion and your commitment to the dedication of the work you do is what has made this country a great place and made this province a great place. Yes, it's true that Chris, Christy Clark has a majority and she's gonna continue to torment you. <laughs> but I make you one promise. If we win the federal election, it will boost the spirits of our activists in this province and the next job at hand is to ensure when her election comes up, we kick our ass out of office. Thank you so much.